The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of The Princess Bride, where we will discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings and all the funny quotes and jokes of this great, great movie. Joining me today on the panel are Mike Denz. Hello, Mike. Hey. And Shelly Kelly. Hello, Shelly. Howdy, Dom. Folks, remember to like Secrets of Movies and TV Shows on Facebook, where we're uh, at facebook.com slash Media. And retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN. And be sure to leave us comments and engage with our social media and uh, help us get the news out about these shows. We greatly appreciate that. And we love to interact with you online. So we're talking about this amazing movie, uh, this uh, The Princess Bride. And one of the reasons we're talking about it now is that it's actually available on uh, D- Disney Plus streaming as of May. Uh, they 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 had a uh, you know, all these new uh, movies are coming out. Uh, you know that the old movies and new movies are being put on the, these various streaming services. And since Disney has the rights to it, they put it on Disney Plus. And so, what better time then to talk about the Princess Bride? And I want to ask you both about your experience with the Princess Bride. It, this it came out in 1987. It's directed by Rob Reiner. Has an amazing cast. But when did you first see the Princess Bride? Uh, she- Shelley, let's start with you. Oh, my goodness. I've been trying to remember if I saw this in the movie theater or if I saw it in college. And I'm pretty sure I saw it in the movie theater. So it came out in the fall of 1987. I was a senior in high school. And I looked back over the movies from 1987 and I saw a good deal of them. So I'm 95 percent sure I saw it in the theater. And How about you, Mike? I, I saw it on uh, either video, well, probably video, um, or DVD. But it was it was at home, <laughs> and I'm not sure why I brought it home. I, I you know I don't know what drew me to it, uh, and I I think I was working for um, a video store at the time, and it might have been because it looked like a good family, like you know, mom and dad will be around and everything, and this will be a safe movie to to have where they won't <laughs> yell at me for swearing or something, and so. Yeah. Uh, but I just remember everyone like not really knowing uh, how to how to take it. Like, it was, what, what's what, what's this movie? What's it doing? And and just ended up loving it, you know, by the yeah. end. Yeah, I, I didn't see this when it first came out. Yeah, I was uh, this was my freshman year in, in college, my first freshman year in college. That's another story. And uh, <laughs> uh, this something called The Princess Bride would not have been something that drew me to the theater. So I I, I missed it when it, when it came out. Uh, but I remember seeing it years later. So, you know, early 90s when I was in Steubenville, I was at Franciscan University uh, and inevitably someone must have brought it up because it's the perfect movie for that crowd. I, I, let's just be honest that that, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, uh devout catholic theology students uh, k- uh kids all you know h- hanging around watching movies this would have been one that came out then so that's when i saw it and i was blown away by it. i'm like how did i never see this there was like a handful of movies that i watched in college where i like how did i never even know about this amazing movie <laughs> so uh and it's it's been amazing for me ever since i've seen it who knows how many times a dozen times maybe more um only it, a dozen <laughs> watched This was right in my wheelhouse when it came out. I was probably its target audience. I was 16 years old. Um, My genre of movies as a teenage girl was anything historical fantasy. Uh, And in fact, the last couple of years before it even came out, I was already watching similar historical fantasies like Lady Hawk and Legend. Oh, yeah. um, Labyrinth, Lady Jane. So I had already seen Carrie Ellis before when this came out. And I, I can't think of any college memory that doesn't include this movie for one reason or another. I know a lot of our friends at, uh, in Steubenville are, are similar, although I, I don't think we ever crossed path Dom, but it was like required, uh, quoting. If you didn't know how to quote princess bride in the grad non-trad crowd, then you, you needed to go watch the movie and catch up. 
yeah, there were there was cultural literacy or uh, that you had had to have yeah. to be uh, in the crowd. So it's it's based on a book by William Goldman, who also wrote the screenplay um, that called The Princess Bride, and it's one of those uh, books within a book, so you know, sort of thing. There's a, a frame narrative of the grandfather and his grandson. And, you know, the the grandson is sick in bed and the grand, it, it, not very sick. Let's be honest. That kid, Fred Savage in this <laughs> didn't look very sick. And uh, the granddad shows up and you could tell like, oh, you know, granddad's, he's always, you know, old fashioned and interrupts and he doesn't, yeah, he grabs the cheek and does, yeah, I, I have to say, uh, um, Peter Falk in this is my dad. Like this, my dad is, <laughs> is totally this granddad. It is so funny. And uh, and so, and it's just this sweet story of a of a grandfather who knows what his grandson thinks of him. He's wiser than the grandson thinks he is, and he knows what he what you know what's going to happen. But sweetly goes along with him and shares this amazing story with him that he knows his grandson will like and perhaps will change his life. In in the sense of, there are books that change your life uh, that you get exposed to in stories, you know that when you hear them or read them, you you don't you, you suddenly I never knew this world existed of of this kind of story. Uh, and it's it's kind of sweet to see that that part of this story here. Yeah, I, I remember Peter Falk. It was the voice. Yes, it, it, there's something so comforting about the way he speaks and the way he reads that story. Yes, yes. The, it, it's so loving in, in that sense. Yes. Without having to, to come right out and say it. And generational, too. And he says the, you know. My father read this book to me, and I read it to your father, and now I'm going to read it to you. And you're just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> also, the line, when I was your age, television was called books, which is, <laughs> which is a great line. Uh, and uh, so I, I mentioned that, yeah, William Goldman wrote the book. I've never read the book. I, I, I kind of. I'm kind of opposite of like my wife. My wife is I I read the book, yeah, but I don't uh, I don't sometimes I won't watch the movies because I don't want the movies to ruin my my experience of the book. I kind of did that with this. I I'm afraid to read the book because I don't want it to, you know, undermine my experience of the movie. I should probably read the book. But Shelley, you've read it. So what do you think comparing them? So I purposely did not reread the book in preparation for this podcast because I didn't want to we were talking about the movie not the book but mm -hmm. I did go and find it it's falling apart um I went looking for our 25th anniversary commemorative edition with the beautiful pages and the illustrations and then my daughter says it's still in her apartment at college and we haven't cleaned <laughs> that apartment out yet so <laughs> so it it is delightfully told it, it's it's kind of like when you watch the six-hour BBC Pride, Pride and Prejudice a lot mm. of the uh, script a lot of the dialogue is lifted right out of the book but there are noticeable differences especially the end and i'm not telling you the end of the book um because we're talking about the movie but one of my favorite parts of the book is that he doesn't write the reunion scene when um wesley says as you wish and falls down the ravine and she, oh and she jumps down the ravine they get down to the ravine and he abruptly stops and he's like I don't have it marked or I would read it to you, but he just is like, yeah, I, I can't tell you anything else about it. Um, apparently Morgan Stern's attorneys and it's copyrighted and they just won't let me make, you know, or he didn't write it. He thought it, it was something you were supposed to think of yourself, you know, and, but if I've written the scene and they won't let me publish it, but I've written the scene. And if you want it, you can write to me at this address in New York. Okay. So like, any good college student, I couldn't write a postcard <laughs> fast enough you know, yeah. or, or, you know, send it off. So what you get back, though, in 1988, 89, is you get this little folded over pamphlet that's uh -huh. typed, you know, like almost a mimeograph thing. And it's this long, dear reader. And it's why he can't send it to you, because there's this um, there's this attorney named Kermit Shog, and he's from <laughs> Florin. So this Florinese lawyer is involved, and it it has this lovely little little scene about why he would be in all this legal trouble to send it to you, money and copyright, and and, and there's a whole there's a whole dialogue of back and forth between them, and you know 
and then there's a PS. I'm I'm not sorry about this. You know how the story ends. And then, you know, he's going to write a sequel, Buttercup's Baby. And then there's PPS. And, and it just goes on and on. Now, I understand <laughs> that you can still request that scene. It's an email that you send now. So I guess right. I, I did not pull the 25th anniversary copy to check and see if it's an email. But there's a website. You can go there. You can put in your email address and they will shoot you back a little response. <laughs> well, and, and so... It's so in case you don't know, like the the book in the movie, so the 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 book that the granddad reads is by an S. Morgenstern. Of course, that's that's not a real book. It's a it makes it up. This is all William Goldman's out, out of his imagination, and it's so as as my wife Melanie said as we were watching it again, she said the, one of the attractions. It's so Monty Python esque throughout the movie. You know, it's just so like it. That's what it evokes is that sort of madcap kind of craziness. I almost think of it as like a Mad Magazine sort of thing. And in fact, in fact, I should have looked at William Goldman. Did he ever work for Mad Magazine? Like, it's just sort of this crazy, like, like, like in 1987, getting people to write him postcards so we can send back this crazy <laughs> pamphlet that extends the story. Earlier, the book was published in 1973. Oh, right, 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 <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you just sent it in 1987. <laughs> I, right. It's just crazy like that. Uh, Mike, did you did you read the book or did you just watch I, the movie? No, I just watched the movie. I do have the book, and I did start the book, and uh, I got bogged down in like how the the the, the pre story. I mean, there's so much in the book that isn't in the movie to begin with, as they okay. set up all the characters and the stages and everything. I don't know why I put it down and didn't get back into it, but I was probably looking for uh, something else at the time. I was probably looking for more about the you know. Um, see what the the movie the parts of the movie and and information on that but i do okay. have it it's said that uh rob reiner when he went to bill's apartment they'd been trying to make this movie for 10 15 years mm -hmm. and that when he went to bill's apartment in new york bill opened the door and he said to him this is my most favorite thing i've ever written in my life which rob reiner took to mean okay so what are you going to do to it and do i really want you to <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, because there have been some infamous adaptations of books out there. Uh, let's talk a bit about the cast. Uh, it is in all well, one of the way, reasons this was a great movie is the all star cast. I mean, this cast is amazing, top to bottom. Uh, starting with Robin Wright, and I have to be honest with you, I, when I, I watched this, I hadn't watched it for years. I came back and watched it a few years ago, and and I look at it and I'm like. Wait a minute, Robin Wright. Robin, that's Claire Underwood from House of Cards. That could not possibly be the same woman. Yes, it is. And it, like, wow, like this was her first really major role. She had a couple minor like TV things before this. Her first big film role. In fact, that's how they ca they credit her as the introducing Robin Wright. And of course, she went on to Forrest Gump and then all these other uh, roles. And she was Robin Wright Penn for a while. Then she just Robin Wright again when they split up. Uh, but it's just it's amazing to see this sweet buttercup <laughs> and Claire Underwood, <laughs> this, you know, uh, this uh, shrewd politician, uh, you know, take no prisoners politician. Uh, but so Robin Wright, Carrie Elwes, who is always no matter what he does, is always Wesley. Just I mean, he, <laughs> uh, Mandy Patinkin, who's uh, an amazing actor, uh, uh, Andre the Giant, who is just the best. He's like. <laughs> He's just Andre, and he's just the best. Wallace Shawn is Vizzini. Wallace Shawn, you know, any Star Trek fan knows Wallace Shawn from, uh, because he was the uh, the uh, oh the Ferengi leader. Oh, the uh, oh, it slipped my mind. I have terrible memory. Uh, Christopher Guest is Count Rugen. Chris Sarandon, who's probably the least known of all of the of the major cast, but who is a who shows up in a lot of stuff in the eighties and nineties. Uh, Billy Crystal and Carol Kane, their short appearance, which is just, you know, it, it become some of the most memorable secondary characters in, <laughs> in cinema. Uh, and then introducing Fred Savage, who would, uh, I think, was this before or after Wonder Years? Was he, had he already start, done Wonder Years at this point? I forget. Oh, that's um, a good question. I don't think so. I think this might have been before Wonder Years. So, but for Fred Savage, and of course, Peter Falk, who just, is uh you know amazing so let me i'm quickly on imdb looking uh he has a long set of things uh the princess bride 
is before the Wonder Years. Wonder Years was 88 and Princess Bride was 87. So this and this would have been filmed before 87. So um, very interesting. So just an amazing cast of 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 all these great actors. Uh, I mean, I mean, I suppose some people would say, oh, you know, Andre the Giant's not a great actor, but it just was great oh, in this movie for him. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, when when they cast him, he was the only one they had in mind to cast. And uh, when Rob Reiner was talking to, to Goldman, uh, Goldman said that he had seen Andre the Giant wrestle in Madison Square Garden. And when he wrote it at the time, that's that's what he had in mind was someone <laughs> like Andre the Giant. Um, and, and you mentioned Robin Wright, and she was in a soap opera called Santa Barbara for about four years. And she was only 19 when she got selected for this. And I thought it was really funny. She was one of the last ones cast and they'd overlooked her, even though her picture was actually up in the casting office's office somewhere. But they were looking for a British girl and she was mm. from Texas. And here she is on this American soap opera. Uh, but they discovered that she could speak with a British accent beautifully because she grew up with a British stepfather. So once they, oh. they actually brought her in and tested her, think it was William Goldman when Rob said, I think we found her. And and William Goldman heard her and said, grab her immediately. Just get her. <laughs> get her quick. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, and I love those stories because, you know, it, had it been a different actress, it might not have worked. This whole thing could have been a disaster or whatever. It's just it's everything just comes together to make these wonderful movies. Uh, so one of the a couple of things I want to mention again in the back before we get into the movie itself. The the music, especially the song Storybook Story, which is just fabulous. It is amazing. What a what a great, great piece of music. Am I the only one that had the soundtrack? <laughs> <laughs> no, my daughter has the soundtrack. Okay. Yes, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have it somewhere on my uh, uh, in my Apple Music. Yes, oh, <laughs> I have mine, that song mine's at an least. old cassette. I was if, if I were different, I would go looking for this cassette. But I know I wore that thing out in college. So. <laughs> But yes, and you know what's funny? I did not know until I started preparing for today who did the music. Uh, Do you know who did the music? I, I knew who did the music. I was just looking again to the reference. It's Mark remember. Knopfler, and it's, he's, yes. he's Dire Straits. That's right. That's right. And it, it changed the whole way I hear it because I've always loved the music. The music fits so beautifully in. It's It's not campy, but it's not, you know, sweeping, you know, John Williams type of things. It, right. It's perfect. And, uh, but now that I, I know it's Dire Straits, I'm listening for it. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's totally Mark Knopfler's voice on the, on the storybook story. You know, I mean, just, he, he, oh, that is such a he Dire Straits sound. Wait a minute. He didn't sing it. Who he sang it? He didn't sing it. Oh, who was it? Um, oh. It's, um, oh, well, I've got it right here. Hold on. I've got to scroll. It's Willie DeVille. Willie? Who, I'd never heard oh, of. Oh, that's a familiar and name. He he went by a different name in his band, something like Mink Deville or Monk Deville, and this was off of one of his albums that came out in 1987. He wrote this story before The Princess Bride, and somehow they got connected. He got connected oh. with Mark Knopfler, and they they used this as the final credits role. Oh yeah, interesting. So if you read the lyrics of the story, they don't match the book exactly, but they fit perfectly because they're talking about a storybook love. Right. And, and, you know, my love is like a storybook story, but it's as real as the feelings I feel. And and I don't want to sound, you know, try to, I don't think much of Willie DeVille, but when you put it with the mix that Mark Knopfler is strumming in the background, if you, if you go and look at the official music video, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And um, it was actually nominated for Best Song <laughs> in the Academy Awards. Wow. Um, unfortunately, it did not win. I think it should have won. Um, <laughs> but, but here's another reason you might not remember this movie so much in the theaters. It lost Best Original Song to another song in a movie called Dirty Dancing. Uh... So Dirty Dancing came out, what, three weeks after Princess Bride? Three weeks before Princess Bride, somewhere right. in that same time frame. And when I think about when I hear it and I think, well, where was I when this movie came out? And I know Dirty Dancing. I remember where Dirty Dancing was. It was in every radio show, every TV show. My yep. aunts were in love with 
what's his face and Patrick Swayze. Patrick Swayze. <laughs> yeah. it, it was it was everywhere and everything. So it was easy for Princess Bride to kind of be forgotten in the theater and be more of an evergreen movie later um, on VHS, DVD, digital. They were competing for the same audience. You know, let's be honest. <laughs> There's pretty much. Uh, yeah, there's an, actually an interesting. There's a series on Netflix about the or the movies that made us or something like that uh, about, you know, movies of the 80s and 90s or something. And uh, I watched the first episode. and It was all about Dirty Dancing. And uh, we're not going to do an episode on Dirty Dancing. But it's very interesting <laughs> to see how Dirty Dancing changed uh, everything about movies from that point on and how much of a big like a, just a cultural bomb it was at that point so yeah i could see where it would suck all the air out of the room and princess bride would have to survive based on the it's a cult status which is, which is what it has attained right now shelly you particularly wanted to talk about the costumes uh oh i well. just wanted to mention them they're so beautiful um they they fit in nicely with that uh, 15th century uh historical pieces mm -hmm. and they're just beautiful. That that beadwork on all of her clothes. Um, I think we all wanted to dress like her. Why well, didn't? But... <laughs> every, yeah. <laughs> every young sixteen year old girl wanted that wedding dress. We wanted that that beadwork and the way it fell and that long golden hair and those big beautiful eyes and and this cute little Juliet cap on the top of your head and it, yep. it was perfect. And if you look at it, it really it really defines um, the characters if you watch them. And they've become iconic. I mean, can you think of the man in black without thinking of that the black mask. suit? And the <laughs> yes. mask. I mean, look at the mask now. Every, everyone's going right. to be wearing them. They're terribly comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I've seen that uh, meme going around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, if you look at the, the prince, Humperdinck, and you look at Count Rugen, they're wearing costumes that are all appropriate to their characters. Um, mm. Wesley transformed from farm boy to Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, you even even um, Vicini. I mean, he's right. wearing a, a a pretty brocaded jacket that would be consistent with a wealthy merchant at the time. Right. Um, so the costumes were done by Phyllis Dalton. Um, she's a British costume designer. She'd won Academy Awards for Doctor Zhivago and Henry V. She won um, Outstanding Costume Design Emmy for the Scarlet Pimpernel, and so she was very well known. And actually, uh, Carrie Elwes, who wrote a book, As You Wish, kind of with some behind the scenes stories, he mentions her uh, to do the masks. They had to do a plaster cast of his head. Oh. <laughs> so that he could have that mask. He could fight and move around and have it fit him perfectly. Yep. Um, but here's something. Do you know that the original costumes and the swords are actually on display in a museum? Which museum? Where are they? It, they're in Seattle, Washington at the Museum of Pop Culture. Oh, wow. Yeah. Their website is terrible, but if you go and <laughs> Google around, you can find lots of pictures of the costumes on display from people who have taken pictures and put them on their blogs or put them inside Flickr. Oh, I, I want to see more of a, um, Inigo's sword. I mean, that was something else. It's in there. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Nice. Well, let's let's get into the the movie itself and talk a little bit about the some of the uh, elements of it. You, as we the, the the major theme of this movie, of course, is the idea of true love that uh, that there is a, a love that goes that transcends the cares of the world, the, the 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 obstacles that the world can throw up in front of us, but that true love always wins out. And uh, and so we, it starts with this farm boy and farm girl, and it's. T typically, and I, when I say starts with, I'm kind of skipping over the granddad and the grandson for the moment. Uh, we'll come back to them. But the, the story within the story, and it, it's very fairy tale because it's a farm girl and a farm boy, and that's it. There's no parents. There's no other people here. It's just the two of them. And it, it's a very interesting choice to really focus on them and to make it a fairy tale. This is what this is. It's not realistic at all. None of this is realistic in, in the details. It's realistic in the, in the emotion and in the, in, 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 in that sort of thing, the human nature aspects. But, um, but I, I was always struck about how awful Buttercup was to Wesley at the beginning. And yet it didn't seem to b bother him at all. He saw through that to her inner beauty and, and goodness and to, to fall in love with her. I mean, did, do you guys feel the same? Did, did that bug you too? I remember, you know, it, it was as a young man, I was 
you know, t- about 20 years old when I saw it, you know, the, the typical girl is going to be that way. And but that now as I grow up and look at it, you can see the interplay of her being like, you know, farm boy, fetch me that picture, even though it's right there and I could reach it. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. I, I just want you to come over here and hand it to me. You know, so she's he, it's almost like he sees through her playing with him uh, to do things for her. That's her way of of kind of telling him that he loves or she loves him. And his way, right. of course, is the as you wish is, is what uh, how he loves her. I thought it was beautifully done. I, the the fresh faces and the the eyes and the way he says it and the way she's you know at first, you know, fetch me my horse. <laughs> but you're right when she says, "Farm boy, fetch me that pitcher." He never takes his eyes off of hers. It's yes. all one motion. He lifts his hand. He gets the pitcher. He hands it to her. He whispers, "As you wish." And every girl's heart went. Oh. <laughs> well, I want it, Wesley. <laughs> well, it, they, they had him like l- looking at her from underneath that bang, carefully hanging down oh. over his eyes. <laughs> it, it was so funny. I wonder how many times Carrie always dropped that picture, like grabbing it uh, without be- looking. <laughs> <laughs> Get another and picture so- on set. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rob Reiner described this movie. As a wonderful traditional classic love story, yeah, true love conquering everything, just in a classic fairy tale tradition. But at the same time, it makes fun of it all, and in that yes. way, it blends together perfectly. It doesn't take itself too seriously. If it took it too ser- itself too seriously, this would not be a great movie. It wouldn't it would hardly be a good movie? It's the fact that it 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 approaches it. It's it treats it with respect, but it doesn't take itself seriously. And I, uh, that's one of the things I like about it. Um, I like that the you know as this part of the movie ends as Wesley's going off to find his fortune they the music swells are about to kiss this is an example of that where it doesn't take itself seriously they're about to kiss and then the 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 boy the grandson stops says, is this a kissing book <laughs> <laughs> I love that and uh, and the granddad someday you're gonna like that part <laughs> which is so great you won't mind that so much yeah yeah you won't mind that so much um so. Uh, you know Wesley's uh, off, and uh, the, and then we get the introduction of the princess, and Prince Humperdinck yeah uh, shows up, who is the ruler of um, Florin. I was uh, mix up Florin and Gilder. Um, wait, it's Florin, right? Yeah, Florin. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I always do that, and so I, I should have stuck with my my instinct. Anyway, um, we have the uh, the introduction of of Prince Humperdinck, which. You know, let's be honest. It's a funny name. <laughs> I mean, like, every kid's gonna laugh at that. Uh, and uh, and so the, the, you have uh, him, and he's obviously a little full of himself. And the introduction of Buttercup, and like, what well, Buttercup? But you know, wasn't she just a farm girl? No, he chose her, and and uh, and she's introduced. And this is an interesting way that they bookend this scene where she's introduced as you know his fiance, and how they'll have that other scene where she's. Uh, "Quote unquote," introduced as uh, the 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 new queen, and uh, and we have the the old lady boo boo and garbage trash, which is just a great uh, a great line. Um, but it, it's sort of jarring. We're like, hey, wait, how, 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 what what's this about? We, we, she, where's Wesley and that sort of thing? So we have that introduction of the the co- the central conflict in this of um, you no. Know, Buttercup and Wesley are supposed to be together. That's what True Love says. And now, now she was told that he was killed by yes. the Red Pirate Roberts. And right. She wasn't. She wasn't told. She found out somehow. She, yeah. They found out that his ship was captured by the Dread Pirate Roberts. And yeah. the Dread oh, Pirate and Roberts and takes no never prisoners. takes prisoners. Never and takes the prisoners. little boy goes, "Murdered by pirates is good." <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, you know, all alone, and she's like, "I shall never love again." <laughs> and then five years passed, right? And and so five years have passed, and she's never going to love again. But now she's going to marry him. But she looks up, but she had no love for him in her heart. Yeah, that's for right. <laughs> Uh, and then we get then we get introduced this great trio who you know they they capture Vizini uh, and Fezig and Inigo Montoya. But let's let's talk here about the, the the three villains of this story, the real villains: Vizini, Humperdinck, and Count Rugen, who is classically like the sidekick of the of the bad guy, who's always just really especially evil. The the thing that characterizes all of them is their arrogance. They're just they're 
their uh, unweaning self-confidence that they are going to beat Wesley. It, the, and that's they're so sure of themselves in every circumstance, they consistently underestimate Wesley. Uh, you, he bests them at every turn, uh, which with Vizzini is this great you know, moment where he keeps saying, inconceivable, how could he possibly... <laughs> you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think, think it, it does. Means. <laughs> uh and and then in for Vizzini that ends with his death for uh, and and Rugen eventually but but Rugen and Humperdinck compound their arrogance with cowardice so that you know as soon as they encounter you know the the a fair fight whether with the Montoya or with uh Wesley they surrender they just they just run away or surrender immediately and i i think that's that's another one of the themes of this movie is how how evil is arrogant and cowardly in in the face of good uh what do you what did you think of these uh the villains in this movie i really i like them humperdinck was so funny because he would say things like if if something happens to her i'll be quite put out you know like yes. he was just he tried to be really cool but he just wasn't he was just a doofus <laughs> you know and um so he was just funny and his hair and everything it was just and the fact that he jumped on his saddle and I'm like, oh, that must have hurt. How did he do that? <laughs> yes. And he was, he was okay anyway. Um, Rugen was more like, you know, uh, evil. And, and like, he was like the brains behind it and everything, you know. And, and he was the one who went into the pit of despair and, and, and tortured people, you know, with his device right. to see what they would be like. And had the six fingers on his hand and killed Indigo's father and all these different things about him. It wasn't until when he actually ran away, you're like, whoa, you know, I mean, that <laughs> I did. I thought he was going to fight because he, you know, he seemed pretty good, you know, like, uh, I mean, pretty bad. And uh, he, he would be able to handle Wesley somehow or, or handle Indigo. Um, so, yeah, he seemed like the, 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 you know, the really evil one in the whole in the whole thing, like as far as capability. But he's so deadpan. Yes. Every line he's delivering is just like. Um, Come, um, sir, we must get you to your ship. <laughs> like, yeah, we're in yeah. action. Lies do not become us. Right. But, or, you know, um, well, you you know, are, are, are you getting enough rest? Oh, Tyrone, you know. <laughs> I've got my, my wedding got my to plan. Country's, <laughs> my country's 500th anniversary <laughs> to plan. <laughs> my wife to murder. Gilda to frame for it. Well, I'm if you haven't got your health, you <laughs> haven't got anything. <laughs> like, oh. yeah, it's now, that this is for posterity, so <laughs> please tell me. How do you feel? <laughs> it's that it's quiet Guest. voice. Yeah, it, it's that quiet voice that he uses all the time. He doesn't yell. He's not, you know, foaming at the mouth. It's very calm. And it's like the banality of evil, you know, that just the, how banal they are is in doing all their evil deeds. Um, uh, that Prince Humperdinck is so vain that it's the idea that people be horrified at his appearance that that really gets him to finally give in and and let them go <laughs> you know it's it's this it's so interesting like how how just completely thoroughly bad they are as as people very well, and, very interesting. at least he humperdinck at least shows his temper you know right. humperdinck gets all well I'm this and I'm that and you know I would not say such things if I were you and uh, <laughs> you know that he's fired the miracle max so <laughs> he at least has a little bit of a temper and he blusters about you know Rugen's just like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's nice how do you feel no <laughs> it, but you're right so when it comes down to the pain versus to the death and he's perfectly willing to yes. do it to the death but he can't imagine living a life of you know, what did they say? M misery, anguish, right? Miserable anguish. Forgot that one. Ooh, I forgot a line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to rewatch it. <laughs> yeah, you get to rewatch it now. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of uh, Count Rugen, let's talk about an ego and this idea of again. It's another aspect of true love, I think, in one sense that he loves his father so much that he dedicated his life to bringing justice to his killer. Now, revenge isn't everything, of course, but this is a fairy tale, so revenge is the way he does it. But he orients everything in his life to becoming the greatest swordsman in the world, or number two, and, uh, and for hunting down the man who killed his father. And when he's unable to accomplish this in the time you know, that, he, that he thinks he should, it, 
it, he starts to crumble because when because Vizzini says, when I found you, you were you were drunk and you, you know, he had begun to despair. And again, when he loses Vizzini, he starts to despair again. And so it's very interesting to you know, this this character, uh, although I have to one there's one this one little plot hole that gets me and maybe maybe the book does it better. But he says the six fingered man killed his father to take the sword. So then why does Inigo <laughs> still have the sword? <laughs> and if, if his father, a master swordsman, made the sword for the six fingered man, it's balanced to a six fingered hand. It's yes. not balanced for Inigo. So as an 11 year old kid, he's been learning to fence with this sword, not balanced to him. Right. So does that mean he couldn't fight with any other sword? Because there's there's a balance. I don't know if you've ever fenced, but there's a balance to your weapon. You you your weapon right. is yours. <laughs> exactly exactly uh it, but it is yeah it is amazing to to to, to uh, this the speaking of this the sword fight like an ego's fight with wesley on the on the, the top of the cliffs of insanity just so the, like again it's a little over the top it's not real sword fighting obviously it's it's movie sword fighting but just like to the point where they're doing the acrobatics on the uh, on the bar. <laughs> Just, it's it's, so it's awesome. the greatest sword fight in the history of fighting. <laughs> it's, it is the greatest sword fight in every movie. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the... Just sword fighting. It's, fen- it's beautiful fencing. Yes. Yeah, they, like, you know, unless someone is studying the Hazel Gripper, and then, you know, which I have. Uh, so they are naming. I don't know. Are these You're using the defense against me? I thought it fitting, considering the rocket train. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Must have studied Kappa Phi. Or... <laughs> <laughs> but how did Wesley learn to be a master swordsman in five years? And poor Indigo, Indigo has been doing it for twenty. Oh, because oh. true love, right? <laughs> because true love <laughs> right, made right, him a master right? swordsman. You know, he uh, picked on, up anything on... he could on that ship. You know, well, that's he was, right. Uh, I'll most likely kill you in the morning. But you know, that was the last scene they filmed. Really? The last scene. Of them. Oh, interesting. They, I did not know that. They did sword fight. They they did sword training, fencing training for eight to 10 hours a day for four months. If they were not in front of the camera filming, they were working with Peter Diamond and Bob Anderson. And you're if you don't know this, you're going to love this. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Anderson actually trained Errol Flynn and Burt Lancaster. Mm. He was the stunt coordinator for Star Wars, for Raiders of the Lost Ark and for the movie right. Highlander. And he's actually in Star Wars, A New Hope. He's the Tusken Raider that surprises Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. Oh. <laughs> now, Bob Anderson was an Olympic fencer from uh, the British team in 1952. He was also in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. He doubled for David Prowse, who played Darth Vader in the mm-hmm. suit. He choreographed the fight scenes for the James Bond films of the 1960s. And at the time of his death, at age 90, he was actually serving as swordmaster for Peter Jackson in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Oh, wow. So these two men, they they choreographed this routine. Now, Mandy Patinkin had learned fencing back at Juilliard, but he hadn't done it in a long time. And once he knew he was going to this movie, he spent two months with the head coach at Yale, who taught him basic steps and then trained him all left hand. And he oh, actually, wow. Mandy Patinkin, well, later you can find it, it says that he was, he actually fights better left-handed now than <laughs> right. But Carrie always had no training at all. And it was very hard for him. Um, and <laughs> so they, they actually had to learn each other's choreography. They had to be able to do it both sides of it. And oh, the wow. first time that they did this for Rob Reiner, Rob Reiner was kind of like, that's it? And they were like, what do you mean that's it? It's been four <laughs> months. This is insanity we've been doing. He's like, yeah, that's too short. We need something longer. We need something more. So they went back. They watched all the old films. They put in the steps and the cliff and the going up the rocks. And they put in the 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 the, uh, the flip. Yeah. Um, and they and they did a few other little tricks there. Uh, but it is it is known even today to be one of, if not the best, <laughs> sword fight fencing scene in any movie. Especially um, if you watch the YouTube version with lightsabers. Oh, yes. Where someone put lightsabers <laughs> in there. It's really yes, cool. I've seen that one. Yeah. You know, fencing academies actually show it to students. <laughs> and they learn from it. What, what I, well, I, I want to modify what I said. Not modify. I want to explain what I said. 
uh, let me back up. Uh, when I said it's not real, not real sword fighting, what I should say is historical sword fighting. When, in fact, in the last twenty years, uh, a lot of historical research has been done that's found that that the way sword fighting was actually done in the medieval in you know, medieval in Renaissance was very different from what we think of as sword fighting, which is lots of. Uh, swords smacking each other a lot that that's not actually how how they did it, it was it was a lot a lot we we might think of it as dirty fighting but it was a lot more gritty uh back in the day uh, that's all yes but this is a movie uh, yes yeah, this is yeah. a fairy tale this is movies <laughs> movie sword fighting and this is how it should should look in a movie like i i agree errol flynn and robin hood or all those like there's lots of like smacking of of, of steel on steel that's unnecessary if someone would just you know just jab them like you know but <laughs> but it just makes such a great scene and it gives you a chance to see the dance and the and great lines and back and forth and you carry the drama of course yes i, I don't you ask what i wish i'd looked be at real. before this is how many how many fencing clubs had their members membership swell after this movie oh, yeah. came out, how many people went and learned to fence? I know I did. I mean, I actually studied fencing in college and became a teaching assistant because right. of this movie. We used to go out. After Hunger Games, yes. a lot of kids started doing archery, so I wouldn't be surprised. Right. We used to go out in the old part of the college where the, the original main building had burned to the ground and all they had left was a kind of a sunken in area. And our fencing club would actually meet out there and recreate <laughs> scenes from this movie. <laughs> Don't awesome. ask me to do it. It's been too many years. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was like me after Harry Potter. I started doing magic. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> when God am love. Oh, wait, wrong movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. So that's an ego. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to... Uh, well, let's talk about it now. Actually, I don't want to come back to it. I want to talk about it now. An ego's scene with, when he finally gets Count Rugen. Like... In the castle, they you know Wesley is is incapacitated. Fezzik is carrying him, and they encounter Rugen. And Inigo said, "This is my chance. I've waited all my life for this." And just abandons all other thought and goes after him. And he gets to the door, can't break through, and he calls on on Fezzik to break down the door for him because like this. I cannot possibly lose him at this point. And you have this <laughs> great chase through all like up and down stairs, and they've end in the in the uh, banquet room. And you think he throws the knife at him and into the gut and you think, that's it. Oh, my gosh. How, what tragedy that he could fail at this point. But of course, he's not going to fail. <laughs> In fact, he'll, he's only going to his revenge. His sense of justice will only heal him uh, because he's a dyad in the force. Never mind. That's something else. Dyad in the force. Uh, uh, and uh, and then he, when he keeps saying like the like the line, hello, I am Inigo Montoya. You have killed my father. Prepare to die. And every time he says it, he gets stronger. And finally, Rugen's like, stop saying it. And uh, and he returns all of the wounds that he gave to him one by one until finally he gives gives him the final blow that 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 really put, you know, brings home the justice to bring his murder, his father's murder to justice. I mean, what a great scene that is. I mean, it really caps an ego as his really, you know, this a classic figure, this character. Yeah, it was kind of like the true love he had for his father was not stoppable. You yes. know, uh, he, he he like kind of prays to his father, like, I'm sorry, father, I, I tried, I tried. Uh, and then he pulls the knife out and, you know, um, true love is totally incomprehensible to Rugen. He's like, well, my goodness, you're 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 still trying, you know, how, how adorable. <laughs> um, and, right. you know, but he comes at him more and more. And this is actually the only time, Shelley, that you do see rugen get mad and start like expressing some emotion like first it's like stop saying that and then he cowardly pleads for his life you know um uh, i'll give you everything whatever you want just you know he's like like you can't give me my father back and oh that's that when line he him. yeah <laughs> that line gives me chills when he yeah. says it uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, i mean just what i mean it just it's so powerfully impactful it's just a great line so Mandy Patinkin lost his father to cancer mm -hmm. several years before this movie. And if you ever get the opportunity to hear Mandy Patinkin talk about this role, he actually talks about how this was very cathartic for him to, to honor his father, to love his father. And that when he filmed that last scene, you know, I want my father back. <clears throat> and he, he said it was like killing the cancer that killed his father. Right. And it was it was very emotional for him. 
you can I see think it comes out in the yes in the, yeah. in the show Beautiful. you totally feel that yeah it is just amazing um so let's talk about uh, Fezzik, played by Andre the Giant, the Gentle Giant. Fezzik is so great, and and you mentioned Shelley that he would like this role was was made for Andre the Giant. I mean, any kid, and in fact, I saw recently that Fred Savage, the one he he filmed all his scenes with Peter Falk separately from all the other scenes, so he didn't he wasn't on the set. But the one actor from the movie he wanted to meet was Andre the Giant because he was a kid who'd watched <laughs> wrestling, and I mean, who wouldn't and you know, it's it's he Andre kind of embodies this whole he's a child in a giant body. He's so he's so gentle. He's so friendly. And and the all reports say that he was like this in real life, that that Andre was was this wonderful person. Now, interesting about Andre is he because of his um his size and was he was such you know unusual. He suffered his whole life with pain because his body his body just carrying this all this uh, this weight and he'd just undergone back surgery before the filming and so this fight scene with with uh, wesley was not like it, it wasn't like it, it, the scenes the close-ups where wesley was on his back uh carrie always is standing on a platform like he was not putting weight on him and and the other scenes where they could see him at a distance carrying around was a stunt double which i don't know where you get a stunt double for <laughs> maybe for uh, Andre the giant maybe you get a regular sized guy and put a a short man on his back oh i i saw this somewhere it was uh one of the two fencing masters um i can't remember which one and he was in a a fezic suit with a fezic oh, okay. mask um and they're on a hydraulic lift pulling them up. But then when they did yeah. the close-ups for the, close, the Cliffs of Insanity, everybody else is on a bicycle seat, not attached to him in any way. And they're standing on a platform. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be, um, what was it, Bob, uh, the, Bob, was it Bob Anderson who was David Prowse's double? Or was it Peter yes. Diamond? Yeah, so it had to be uh, Bob Anderson because David tall. Prowse is also very tall. Yeah. So I, I'm going to guess it was him. Well, and then the scene where... Uh, where they um they what was it uh, buttercup jumps out of the window at the end and he and he and he holds her he's, he you know she drops into his arms she was on wires obviously but uh, so he wasn't carrying her weight she was she was suspended by cables but uh, but uh, it, yeah such such a great like the whole like the the rhyming and just, yeah the rhyming and, you know, really introduced those two really well you know like yeah <laughs> he's like he's not as dumb as he looks he's the best rhymer you know, yes. I mean, stop that. And I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? <laughs> and they showed the friendship between those two, the way yeah. that those two were able to connect as friends separate from right. being just hired hands, hired marauders. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about um, Wesley becoming the Dread Pirate Roberts. Now, this is a, a great little gimmick that they have where uh, Wesley is not dead. He is the, you know, this guy who's Dread Pirate Roberts. He is this... Um, this guy that you're supposed to be a, a villain, but turns out um, he get the, the villain transforms. It's like Batman handing down the cape to, you know, Robin, you know, over time. You know, how does he keep going on after decade after decade? Oh, it's because it makes me wonder, though, what did Wesley do as a Dread Pirate Roberts? <laughs> Is he a mass murderer, Wesley? Come on. <laughs> no, I, I think it's all reputation. It's all like, you know, the Derek Private Rivers doesn't take prisoners. Well, obviously he does because he didn't kill Wesley. And it would all be right. like, you know, good work, Wesley, sleep well. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, it was, uh, but he never did. So was the Dread Pair Roberts all just kind of fluff and, and, and you know, rumor and, and he just stood on his uh, reputation, but he, so he didn't have to kill anybody. So then he would say, "This time I'm letting you live, but <laughs> yeah. I, I kill. Every, I always yeah. kill everyone, but this time yeah. I'm letting. Well, I'm gonna let you live Ooh. this time, you know. And <laughs> and I think that's kind of the way, you know, Wesley kind of like, you know, no one will listen to the Dread Pirates Wesley, but they'll listen to the Dread Pirate Robert. <laughs> right, right. It's all about the reputation. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> and then when he counters uh, Buttercup, he's he is saving her, even though at that moment he thinks she has been faithless to him. Uh, and and it's very interesting that character moment where, where even though he he is you know he's almost you know angry with her he's very you know intensely you know you betrayed me but I'm saving your life you know that's that just it's just as as a matter of course it's not even it's not even questioned that why that why would he be saving her life even though he's angry at her for for betraying him and then 
that moment when they they're fighting on the top of the cliff and this really steep cliff frankly <laughs> they, before they go into the uh, to, into the fire swamp um and it's when she says you know oh go kill yourself or whatever i forget exactly what she says but she pushes you can him die too for all i oh, care sure. right yeah. right and uh it's when he says as you wish as he's falling there is immediate recognition she immediately when when he says which is essentially i love you there's immediate recognition so when in true love when you're no matter what when your love says i love you you recognize them in that there's that that moment of recognition and that's and then she throws herself down the hill and then we have this great the stunt doubles uh including the guy let's be honest that's the guy in uh, buttercup's dress tumbling down the hill <laughs> Like you could, you could tell, uh, even in the old uh, transfers for, to digital, that it's a, a dude. But it's very funny. But uh, but she recognizes him in the in the saying of "I love you." Their 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 pet phrase for each C- other. Couldn't couldn't you say that that was Wesley's definitely Christ like moment where uh, you know you sinned against me, but I love you anyway, and I'm going to rescue you. But I'm pretty up, you know. But we have to deal with this whole faithlessness, and then you can die. For all I care, and I will die for you, you yeah. know, as you wish. So you do have Wesley, yeah. you know, embodying that at, at, in that scene, most of all. And Wesley's reborn in that, yeah, in that moment, yeah, yeah. resurrected. Uh, <laughs> yes. Let's talk about uh, Miracle Max and Valerie, his wife. Which I just love that her name's Valerie. Which is, <laughs> you know, it, it's not like crone, you know. She calls her uh, witch. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. <laughs> and after and, what you uh, just said, I don't know how to do that anymore. <laughs> I mean, uh, what it's great here is that Billy Crystal and Carol Kane improvised most of their lines, and um, yeah, and uh, they came up with the backstory between them. They created the, these characters. Uh, for I mean, Rob Reiner gave mm-hmm. him a, a lot of leeway in doing this, but so much like great, like like uh, Miracle Max just feels like this guy you'd meet in Brooklyn. You know, it's got this real <laughs> New York sort of. Thing, uh, what do you have to live for? Mutton, Ooh. lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Mm, though the mutton is just so perfect. Do you know how That's long it took me to find out what mutton is? I'm like mutton. <laughs> you obviously did not read lots of uh, 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 swords uh, fantasy books. No, I mutton didn't. is it. It doesn't taste good. Let's just <laughs> just be honest here. That's mutton. probably why it has to be nice and lean. <laughs> oh, you mentioned that the, the Billy Crystal and Carol Kane got together for months in New York. Right. Because they only came in for three days of filming. They spent months together coming up with this elaborate backstory about who Miracle Max was and, and, and Valerie. Why has that never been released? I would think <laughs> I right now is a perfect time for Billy Crystal and Carol Kane to get together. And put, that should no be kidding. a YouTube movie or something. Or, or, or a Broadway play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're old enough now. You won't have to add more, as much makeup. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, what, but he says, what do you got to live for? And, you know, and it, what's what keeping Wesley alive, he should be dead. The machine should have drained all his life. What does he get to live for? True love or to believe, but <laughs> true <laughs> to love believe. Uh, to believe. Uh, uh, but uh, and it's true love that's keeping him alive, that 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 does, you know, the, to be reunited with the one he loves. And that is, you know, it, it, it propels that story for that theme of of true love. But he said it. Death cannot stop true love. All it That's can do right. is delay it a delay little it while. <laughs> exactly. Then we have, uh, so, so they have to, they have to break into the castle. Uh, it's, this is um, uh, Anigo's plan to, he, he went and got Wesley. He had, Anigo's faith that, that, that justice, he could get justice, even though the man is dead. It, we have, I have faith that this is going to come together. And so he gets Fezzik, he gets Wesley, they get, they get together, they go to the castle, the castle's gate is guarded by 60 men. Um, I, 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 there's so much to quote. We'd be here all day if I, if I <laughs> went through every, every awesome moment in this. Um, meanwhile, Humperdinck is accelerating his plans. He's got, he's got the buttercup. They're at the altar with the bishop. <laughs> With the lisp, which the, who's who says the impressive clergyman is what he's just, the impressive clergyman yeah, is how he's, his uh, uh, credited in the his cast. credit. Yeah. <laughs> Mowage is what brings us here today. I've seen a quarantine uh, meme with him as well. <laughs> quarantine is what keeps us here today. <laughs> and uh, and Humperdinck is only interested in just getting to like this moment. There's no love in Humperdinck, just except for himself. Um, it just ambition 
and in in Buttercup is a means to an end. And so in in his rush, he omits her consent. And therefore, as Wesley rightly points out later, no consent, no marriage. And so <laughs> didn't there's, say it, you didn't do it. That's right. And uh and and it's again, it's that counterpoint to true love. I mean, just for, for Pumperdink, there's no love. There's no and and this is what undermines him. He he defeats himself here because they're not married uh, in this moment. A technicality that will be shortly remedied. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he he just wants to marry her to kill her so he can, you know, like you said, to, to go to war. I mean, it's all about himself. Um, you know, say man and wife, man and wife, man and wife, you know, and <laughs> let's get out of here. And and, right. and the clueless parents. Well, the mother's not as clueless as the king is, but she kissed the, me. The king's senile. <laughs> he doesn't know what's going on. Yes. I'm, a, I'm, about to, I'm going to, murder, I'm about kill, to myself kill myself. Won't that be nice? <laughs> Won't that be nice? She kissed me. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. they they defeat Humperdinck without killing him, by the way, which is interesting. They leave him alive to to be defeated, to, to live in his, his ignominy of, of defeat. And... They escape, and you know the, we have the the grandpa reading the end of it, and the, how in the in the history of kisses, uh, uh, this is the greatest of them all. Yeah. And at the end of the movie, as the, as the granddad's like leaving, now it's dark. You know, it's he's been there all day reading this book to the son, to, to the grandson, and he's putting on his coat, and he's doing the whole like checking his pockets and and I kind do of that all the time. It's totally that. <laughs> yes, totally. Uh, and uh, the grandson's like, you know, you could come back tomorrow and read it again if you want. And that moment where he turns the sparkle in his eye and he says, as you wish. And and I love this because the grandson appreciates and loves the granddad for his acts of service. But he can't come out and say it because that would be, you know, icky. <laughs> and the gr grandfather tells the boy he loves him in a way that won't embarrass him, but that the grandson will recognize from the story. And I love that moment between them. I love that that frame narrative of because. Uh, you know, I, my wife and I read to our kids. Uh, you know, all uh, we, well, not as much anymore. They're 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 older now, but we always read to them. And you know, there's the books that they would request over and over again every night, and you would be, and yet you would do it because this is this is because you love them, and this is what they want. And you, and you know, you might skip a few things here and there every once in a while. <laughs> and, um, it's the progressive books that always got me. We had to read the same line, and you added a line to every page. Oh, oh. It's got to me for a while, but never, nevertheless, but you would still do it. And like my daughter, a little personal note, my daughter, my oldest, when she was young, we had this book. It was a book of American, like an American song book, like all the classic, you know, uh, I can't, can't. Oh, my darling that. Clementine. Yes. Yes. All the great, yeah, all those great classic ones. It was called In and Out the Window, I think. And it was the story book, uh, the, the song book. And she would want to, me to sing the songs to her. I mean, there's like a hundred. I mean, like, I'm not singing all these. I don't even know these ones. Like, but every night we'd have to sing the songs to her every night. And, but yet it was just something that, that she, that was love for her, for me to do that to, for her. And uh, that's what I got, like, you know, with this. In fact, I might have been inspired to be that way as a dad from see, this scene with the granddad. So I just love this, this relationship with them. I like what you just described that it's multi generational. You know, you have you have not just um, Wesley and Buttercup, not just Inigo and his father, but now you also have the grandfather and the grandson. And it, it, yeah. it's just such a good example that that love is an action. Love is a choice and that love is more powerful than anything else in the life. Even death. Right. It, it transcends it. Yes. And they do it in such a beautiful almost simple understandable way without shoving it in your face it, but it's just it's it's laid there and you're laughing and it's not until you get that warm and fuzzy kind of right there at the end that you're like oh look what they did look how beautiful this was most people thought it was just a rollicking good time with a lot of humor but but there's so much more to it there love is stronger than death and love is this great story but it's also found in the everyday little ways we love each other, the 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 little acts of service, the little acts of just of of loving. Uh, 
Um, like you said, husband and wife, father and son, mother, daughter, grandparent and grandchild, like all the, that in, in family, in those relationships. Yeah. I, I, I mean, see it. in the movie, he's taking a picture down from above and my house. Sometimes I have to get my husband to <laughs> take a frying pan off of that rack that he hangs it on that I can't reach or, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I remind me, I need to get gas in the morning and Oh, I'll go get it for you right now. And off he goes. And I'm like, I always tell my teenage daughters, that's love. Okay. When somebody says, no, I don't want you going. It's almost dark. I'll go and get gas for you. It's, it's a, it's a minor, small little thing to stop and get gas in my car. Right. And yet he's, he's, I'm not asking him to do it. He's doing it for me because he loves me. And I see those. I know those. Love doesn't have to be the grand gesture. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting how they juxtapose the the little things he does on the farm. And then after he's quote unquote resurrected, he's sailing, you know, uh, through eel infested waters at night <laughs> for a pleasure cruise, you know, so he follows her, he climbs this rope faster than Fezzik. He out duels the best dueler. He out muscles the giant. He out thinks, you know, it's like now, uh, you know, that he's perfected everything. The love is just bulldozing over everything. Um, right up until the very end, he, and he even dies again, you know, uh, you know, for real this time, but only partially. Um, it's it's a it's really a cool kind of uh, Christ like love that sacrifices and can't be stopped. Well, it, love makes you powerful. It makes you it gives you that endurance and that ability to stay focused on what your goal is there, and that goes right back to what we said about Inigo when he gets the, the knife in the gut and he's pulling it out. Oh, sorry, father. But then all of a sudden he rallies because this, this, this act of not revenge, but, but of justice for his father, of, of coming to terms and, and slaying that which slayed his father. It, it's the same type of thing. It, yeah. Love gives life and it makes life uh, worth living. So I, I want to round things out here with, um, well, I mean, this, like I said before, this is one of the most quotable mo movies. I quote it all the time in daily life. And I want to go through my top 10 quotes. These are the ones I pulled off the top of my head. So I feel like these are my top 10, but there are more than way more than 10. But uh, let, let me go through it. My first one, life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. My kids have heard this so many times. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. Hey, life is pain. <laughs> so that's um, really there's some there's some wisdom in that one yes yes uh anybody want a peanut anytime someone says something rhyming <laughs> with peanut this is something i say uh, uh i constantly say when i'm when i'm saying goodbye to someone like with see, see you later or whatever have fun storming the castle boys you think they'll make it it'll take a miracle uh, 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 something i always say um i always say to the pain like when you say to the death or, or you know whenever that comes up <laughs> that doesn't come up it comes up surprisingly often in life uh, at least in my life um the hello i'm inigo montoya you've killed my father prepare to die i say that um uh, you are the brood squad <laughs> 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 that's a good one um uh, this one's a little bit uh, uh, on the edge, but uh, you know, rest well and dream of large women. I just thought that when I was when I was twenty, that was the funniest thing ever. Uh, the next one it has to be said in the way of the of the actress saying it, but when when uh, the albino says the pit of despair, <coughs> and he you know clears his throat. <laughs> Whenever I have like a like a sore throat, I have to, I have to clear my throat. I always think of that. Uh, inconceivable. I, and uh, I do not think it means what you think it means whenever someone uh, uses a word uh, incorrectly. <laughs> and of course, number the number one quotable line is as you wish. Uh, so, uh, which I, I love to use uh, as well. Uh, do you guys, I didn't prepare you guys ahead of time with a, with a list, but anything you want to add to that list of your favorite quotes? Uh, I, I would, one of my favorites is my way. My way is not very sportsmanlike. Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, that is great. It's like, I'm gonna hit it with a when you know when he comes around the corner, hit it with a rock. My, uh, so that's that, and that quote leads to his whole, you know, way of what he wants to fight Wesley. Let's just do it, you know, without any yes. tricks or swords or anything. Um, so that's uh, definitely one of my favorites. Uh, and I like I said before, I'm I I I don't even think of the movie. I'm just patting down pockets that aren't there and going, oh, okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> yes. And I'm doing Peter Falk, you know, like yes. looking for his keys, 
when he's leaving, I don't know why I do that, but it's just one of those. Which is essentially Columbo. Me. Yeah, that's yes, Columbo yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I have to I, I have to amend this before someone calls me out on this. I did miss, of course, the most important one of all, which is never go up against the Sicilian when death is on the line. <laughs> you just took mine. <laughs> so, as a Sicilian, like, I have to say. We didn't prepare the, you, and I, I know, same thing here. <laughs> as a Sicilian, I'm sitting here going, oh, you can't leave Wally Sean's line now. That's just <laughs> yeah, too <exactly>. perfect. <laughs> I know. You I fell know. victim to the classic blunder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only only slightly less, less well known is this never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line and then and she's like to the and side. all this time it was your cup that was poisoned <laughs> They were both poisoned. I've spent the last few years building up an immunity to Iocane powder, which, by the way, is not real. Okay, don't Google yes. it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, of course, Humper thinks later line, Iocane powder, I bet my life on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's tasteless. It's, it doesn't smell like anything. <laughs> <laughs> trying to pick one line out of, I mean, and even a list yeah. of 10, you said it, you didn't prepare. So you know me, I'd have had you a list. But yes, I'm sitting here. Oh, I mean, how often do we say, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Constantly. Yeah. One of the I, ones I loved was, um, you know, what are the three uh, terrors of the fire swamp? And he's like, you know, one is the lightning quicksand. And you are clever enough to discover what that looks like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Wesley, what about the RUSs? <laughs> Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. <laughs> he's already seen them. <laughs> he's he's already to... seen them, right? Yeah, yeah. that's. I love and, that. And another connection to Star Wars. It's a little person in there, and that little person <laughs> also was in a, a, a labyrinth and a couple of Star Wars too. So. Yep. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah just uh there there are so many great lines in this movie um and, and i guess i one last thing is shout out to the the location shoots uh the cliffs of insanity are uh the cliffs of moore in ireland that that's where they they the establishing shot of that um the countryside that they ran across was in derbyshire ireland and uh they yeah, some of the castles and that sort of thing so beautiful oh. beautiful ireland it, uh, great britain it. It isn't Ireland. I hate to oh, correct you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. Because if, if you didn't correct me. Yeah, England. They filmed in Haddon Hall. Humperdinck's Castle is Haddon Hall, which dates yes. back to 1087 and right. was completed in 1427. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I should go I'm look sorry, that yes. one up. Thank you for picking uh, uh, Derbyshire, Sorry. England. I was saying uh, close to more in Ireland, but yes, uh, the Derbyshire, England. So it's Great Britain in Ireland. Uh, and it was just beautiful, beautiful parts of, that, of those countries. Uh, so awesome to see. Let's see. I think that anything else you guys want to say about this? Uh, uh, Shelly, I know you could probably say a lot more <laughs> as a super fan, but uh, anything else we want to add that we just have to add to this uh, before we wrap things up? I think I want to tell you that, uh, you know, the scene when he notices Count Rugen has six fingers on his hand. Yes. And the Count draws the sword, whacks him on the head with it. Yep. The first time they did it, uh, Carrie always writes in the book, the first time they did it, it didn't look right. And he said, why don't you just really tap me on the head? Well, the scene that's in the movie, uh, Count Rugen, uh, Christopher Guest, he really knocks Carrie Elwes unconscious. So oh, wow. what you see is Carrie Elwes falling down unconscious. He wakes up later with them stitching up his head. Oh, my. <laughs> and that's not the only time he got hurt on the set. Oh, he wow. actually broke his left foot big toe. And you can see it in all those scenes up on top of the cliffs when he's talking. The life is pain. And he's sitting down against that log with his hands behind his head. His toe is broken. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you really see it when they're running into the fire swamp. It's kind of this little hop limp gait. When, when they're running, he's I like noticed that. Yeah. Limping. His toe is broken. <laughs> <laughs> he was running kind of funny at that point. Uh, I did like, by the way, when he got to the top of the Cliffs of Insanity, where like he, he needs to empty like out his boot. He's got these giant rocks. In his boot. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the first time he and um, Inigo Montoya meet. And you would yes. think there'd be a little bit more. Uh, a more palpable friction between them right but they talk and even they fight and they smile and they counter each other with such camaraderie 
And you, when you know that that's the last thing they filmed, you understand it because they've just spent all this time together filming and, and being together. Um, and at the same time, it wasn't until I read the book that I realized there's a spot where it feels very awkward. And that's between Robin and, and Carrie Elwes. It's in the fire swamps. It was the very first day of filming. So uh. the very first day of filming, he's trying to say, well, you know, it's, 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 you know, I'm not saying I'd like a summer home here, but it's, the trees are quite lovely. <laughs> yeah. And her dress catches on fire. And that's the very first day. So now when I watch this, I see them and I can tell that the way he and she talk to each other is not the same as the way they interact in later parts of the film. Interesting. You know, with that scene with an ego, I know we're going on again, but uh, that scene with an ego <laughs> and uh, Wesley on the top of the cliff, it, that camaraderie, I think it also contrasts with like, it's that sense of fair play, that fair fight that they're having. They're, 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 you know, they're fighting to the death as far as I know, but there's still this where, where good guys were, it's a fair play. And it contrasts again with Humperdinck and Rugen, you know, that, that, that it makes the character contrast so even much greater. And you like these guys, even, you know, even in this moment here where you're first getting to know them, so yeah, I I agree. I, and, and but it is it is really interesting to see those relationships in the, in those those parts. Oh, when there's another quote there. It's uh -huh. when he knocks them out and he says, "I would just as soon destroy a stained glass window as an artist like yourself." Yes. However, since I can't have you following me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> All right. All right, let's I'll wrap just it say up my, before my we final go quote. From... My final okay, quote good. is yep. is no one ever survives a fire swamp and you're only saying that cuz no one ever has. <laughs> yes, and no one ever survives a podcast like ours. Uh, you can only say that because no one ever has. <laughs> so as we as we wrap up, I do want to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to have this great conversation and create the secrets of movies and TV shows, including this time Maya H, Leslie H, Jeff V, Lindsay S, and Ahmad A. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of movies and TV shows and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So we leave it to you, the listener. What do you think of The Princess Bride? Is this a movie that you've always loved from the time you were young? Is this a movie you've, you've only just known or had never seen it before? You can let us know and let us know your favorite quotes if we haven't mentioned them by posting at sqpn.com slash secrets or at the StarQuest Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media, or you can send us an email to secrets at sqpn.com. Until next time, Shelly Kelly, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of the Princess Bride. Always a pleasure. Mike Dens, thank you as well. Thanks. Have, some, have fun storming the castle. <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of movies and TV shows on StarQuest. And remember, death cannot stop true love. It can only delay it for a while. Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. <laughs>